This morning, I'm going to be continuing in on the sermon series entitled Faith for the Real World, based upon the gospel of Mark. And before I jump into this sermon, I want to thank Katie Moran, who preached for me last Sunday as I was away getting some rest. And Katie and her husband, Josh, have exited Chi Alpha Campus Ministry on grounds at UBA and have moved to James Madison University to pioneer a new campus ministry there. But I really want to thank her for so ably uh, filling the pulpit in my absence. The Gospel of Mark, Faith for the Real World. This morning's sermon is one that I know is going to touch a lot of hearts and lives because it touched mine while I was writing it this week. But in line with this, we're going to be dealing with probably one of the tougher aspects of our faith as followers of Jesus. Before we get there, though, I want to continually remind us as a church that our church is based on three pillars. We are a biblically-based, relationally-driven, spirit-led church. And in essence, what that means is being biblically-based means we take seriously the Scriptures We believe that through them we discover who God is and how God loves us and works in and through our lives, and this sermon series on the gospel of Mark, Faith for the Real World, is no different. But the interesting thing about the gospel of Mark is it is the most concise, it's kind of the Reader's Digest version of the gospel. We know that it was written to people who were being persecuted for their faith. In the Gospel of Mark is, are the things that we need in order to follow Jesus and to serve others. And so this morning I want to deal with a short episode from the Gospel of Mark, but one that we're going to find deeply challenging for faith in the real world. It's found in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Mark 4, 35 through 41 It's famously known as Jesus calms the storm. Jesus calms the storm. Here's what Scripture tells us, Mark 4, 35 through 41. It says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that they were nearly swamped. You can get the picture and the vision of them bailing out this water as it's pouring over the sides of the boat, verse 38, and it says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up and he rebuked the winds and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely, utterly calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. As you know, in the sermons that I preach, I almost always give us the context, and I want to do that again this morning so we can all be kind of on equal footing, even if you've never maybe read the Bible before. Maybe if you're just kind of checking out faith, context is important because it allows us collectively to approach this story from the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 again on equal footing. The Bible tells us this episode starts when evening came. The Bible tells us that Jesus was taken just as he was. It's kind of an odd phrase in the original language. And the reason why it says that is Jesus, if you were to read the prior verses in in, in Mark 4, you would discover that Jesus has been teaching from the boat. So he's been teaching almost all day. He's been teaching from the boat And there are people who've been lining the shore, and as evening comes, he essentially says to his disciples, let's head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the reason why he was teaching from a boat is that in the ancient world, they had discovered that you can get offshore in a boat, and it's almost like as your voice moves across the water, it's sort of a broadcast system. It has a way of almost amplifying the voice so you can reach a larger crowd. 
The Bible tells us that Jesus was in the stern or in the back of the boat, and he was asleep on a pillow, and there were other boats with them. You know, it's interesting, but the way this episode in the Gospel of Mark is written, it's clear that John Mark, who wrote this gospel, received this story firsthand from someone who was a personal eyewitness in the boat. The little tidbits, the little parts of this story about what happens, even though it's brief, lets you know that this was a firsthand eyewitness. It's kind of got that flavor to it. And here's why when you hear a story that's given by a firsthand witness, it has those little nuances that normally would not be in a story. As I was kind of thinking about that, I was thinking about a friend of mine when we were serving in Princeton, New Jersey. I had a friend of mine, her name was Millie McAllister, and she had grown up in Princeton. She's now gone home to be with the Lord, but at the time, her uh, son-in-law was a friend of mine. And one time when I was over visiting at the house, she said, would you like to hear stories of people that used to live in Princeton? And I said, sure. And she started by saying this. She said, when I was a tiny little girl, Albert Einstein used to come and watch me and my brother play jacks. Now, how many of you are interested in this story, <laughs> right? And she says, you know, Dr. Einstein would come, we would play jacks, and she said that the way he talked was in very broken English, and he would get his verbs and his nouns backwards. Not only that, even in the heat of the summer, he would wear an overcoat and this was fascinating. She said, everyone in Princeton knew the reason why he was four and a half blocks or five blocks away from where he worked at the university is he was lost. Albert Einstein would get lost. He would leave his office and he couldn't find his house. As a matter of fact, to this day, if you go down Mercer Street in Princeton, the house where he lived is painted bright red. His wife did that so that he could find his way home. He would literally walk by the house and wouldn't even know where he was. The bright red door would kind of invite him in. She also told me stories about Al Capone. Albert Einstein and Al Capone both used to visit her house. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but listen, when Millie would tell us those stories... There were these little nuances to where you knew she'd been there. The stories were so cool and so rich. The other thing that I think is important to know is the cultural context of this story. Not only is it that this is sort of coming from the memory of someone who was in the boat with Jesus, but it's also got this very unique cultural context, and I want you to catch this because it's so key for us to understand what God wants to say to us about our faith in a real world. N.T. Wright, who's a Newer Testament scholar that I read extensively, says this about the cultural context of this episode in Mark 4. He writes, apart from fishermen, and if you've read the Newer Testament, you would know the majority of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. But here's what he says, apart from fishermen, the Jews were not a seafaring people. They left that to their Phoenician neighbors to the north. The sea came to symbolize for them the dark power of evil, threatening to destroy God's good creation, God's people, and God's purposes. In books like the book of Daniel in the Older Testament, the sea is where the monsters come from. And if you look into the Newer Testament, you will notice that the sea in the book of Revelation is the place where the beast comes up out of. In other words, in Jewish culture and in Jewish theology, the sea is the seedbed for evil. It's where demonic powers rise up and out of. Now, for those of you who like an even deeper biblical context, very briefly, if you were to take Mark chapter 4, those verses we just read, and overlay them over the book of Jonah, they are identical. It's stunning. The prophet Jonah in Jonah chapter 1 is in a boat. A storm begins to overtake the boat. Jesus and Jonah are both asleep in the story and must be woken up. It's fascinating, but in the Older and Newer Testaments, the same word that's used to wake up is used in both. 
What we discover in both the story of Jonah and Mark chapter 4 is that in both of them, there's a miraculous intervention of God. And what's really interesting, if you know the Older Testament story, you would know that when the storm hits, the crew that Jonah's in the boat of are not Jewish. They do not know the God of Israel. And when the storm hits, there's something uniquely harsh about the storm, and they discern that there's a supernatural force behind the storm. So they draw lots to see who's on the boat and who's to blame for what's happening. Jonah draws the short straw, and they know it's because of him that the storm is raging against the boat. What those other seafaring men do is they pray, And they say to the God of Jonah, please stop the storm. And Jonah steps forward and says something very fascinating. He says, unless you throw me overboard, everyone will perish. In other words, Jonah must die so that other people will live. It's incredible. And if you know the story, especially many of us learned it as kids, These seafaring men who are not serving the God of Israel pray a prayer to the God of Israel and say, please forgive us for what we're getting ready to do. Please don't judge us. And they throw Jonah overboard. And instantly the storm stops. Well, if you know the rest of the story, Jonah gets eaten by a big fish. And this was always my favorite part as a teenage boy. He gets vomited up on the beach three days later. I love that. Now, what's amazing, though, is in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus references Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days, and he assimilates that to the time between his death and resurrection. The same way Jonah is in the belly of the whale, so will I be in the middle of the earth. Moving on, what we begin to discover is we think about the story that we've just read and the idea of faith in the real world, is we discover that in the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus has been doing teachings, these extensive teachings that have lasted all day up into the evening. What he's been teaching on are parables that teach what the kingdom of God is like. If you were to read chapter 4, you would discover Jesus literally says, the kingdom of God is like, and then he shares a parable. Then he goes, the kingdom of God is like, And he shares another parable, and there's hints in Mark 4 that he told a ton of parables that were not listed. But as with this sermon, oftentimes we can sit through a sermon on faith and the kingdom of God. I want you to catch this. You are tested much more quickly than you would have ever dreamed. You see, the disciples are listening to these teachings about what the kingdom of God is like and how faith works. They get into the boat, and within minutes or at most an hour, they're in the midst of a raging storm. Whenever I read Mark 4 and about that raging storm and how they're bailing out that boat and scared for their lives, and you have to remember, many of these in the boat with Jesus are fishermen, They have sea legs. They're familiar with the sea. And if they're in the boat and they're panicking for their lives, it's bad. Whenever I read this story, I think about one of the most difficult things I've ever faced as a pastor. I've been at City almost 21 years and probably about 15 years ago when we were worshiping in the chapel over on Ryle Road, there was a family that began to attend City. And after the first service where they were in attendance, the dad came up to me and he asked if I would meet with he and his wife, and they had a girl with them that appeared to be about 12 years old, and I said, sure. So we met. I ended up hearing one of the most horrific stories I've ever heard. It was a story about this family. He was a physician in Harrisonburg. He worshiped at a church there, but he took a brief vacation to go to the Baltimore Inner Harbor. So he had the daughter that was with him and two younger children, a boy and a a younger daughter than the one that was with them. So they took this boat tour around the inner harbor of Baltimore Harbor. And out of nowhere, what's called a microburst hit the inner harbor. 
And that tour boat that they were riding in was literally flipped upside down by a harsh, violent gust of wind. Many people drowned in that boat, including their son, and the other daughter was trapped underwater for over 30 minutes. Because of how cold the water was, she survived, but for all intents and purposes had no brain function left. When I met them, they were attending City Church, and they had her at the Kluge Rehab Center on Ivy Road, which has now been torn down and is being rebuilt. I remember sitting with that family and watching them process through what had happened. It was stunning. The dad is a physician. The mom was an incredibly articulate person. And when we met, the dad actually had to keep going back as a physician to work, and she lived here with her younger daughter. We would go into my office, and she would ask me questions. And they were all about, how do you keep your faith in the midst of something like this? Listen. Jesus' disciples exit the shore, and they've heard all about faith. And within minutes, at least inside of an hour, they are in the battle of their lives. The storm is raging. They're convinced they're going to drown. But here's what I know. Most of us here, when we think of the storms of life, we will never be in an actual boat like this family from Harrisonburg was. Most of us will have a different type of a storm. Here's a few that God put on my heart as examples. A storm could be a child who has gotten horribly sideways with God's best for their lives. A storm could be that there is a disease that is undermining your health or the health of someone you love and there is a tenuous remission of that disease or just simply bad news. A storm could be financially or with a job where it just seems like there's a long series of trials in that regard. A storm could be that you are in a marriage where meaningful love is not being returned. A storm could be that you've had an ideal and an idea about someone or something that has been recent, recently tarnished or shattered. A storm could be that someone you love deeply Simple not, simply will not go and get the help that they need. A storm could be a specific promise from God that has been painfully slow in coming your way, but it seems like others around you are being blessed with that promise being f fulfilled. You see, a storm does not have to be in a boat. It doesn't. A storm can be defined, and I believe is defined, by what the disciples said to Jesus. They go and they wake him up. In verse 38, he is sleeping on a, on a cushion, and they wake him up, and here's what they say to Jesus. Don't you care? I believe that that is one of the primary definitions of a storm of life. It's when we're in the midst of something and we feel like we need to wake God up. It feels like Jesus is asleep in the midst of our storm. And so we go to Jesus and we say, don't you care, I'm drowning. And what I love about the Psalms in the Older Testament is that the Psalms are filled with honesty from David and other Psalm writers who pour their hearts out to God and they proclaim similar things to what we are just now reading in verse 39 of Mark 4. God, are you awake? Do you even care? Wake up. But there's a little something here that you will miss in the English that I think helps us begin to process forward. And it's this. Jesus, in his command to the waves, uses a unique Greek word that means be still. It's the word he uses. And if you were a scholar of the Newer Testament languages, and especially Greek, you would find out instantly that that word is only used one other place in the Gospel of Mark. 
It's used in Mark chapter 1, verses 25 and 26, and it gives us a hint into faith in the real world with the storms of life. Mark 1, 25 through 26. Be quiet. That's the word that's used to rebuke the waves. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently, and he came out of him with a shriek. You see, Jesus' use and utility of Greek, that word as it's translated to us, lets us know that when Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, he sees a spiritual force behind it. It's more than just a natural storm. There's something in it where there's satanic evil opposition to what he's doing with his disciples, and he looks and simply commands, be still. Now, here's what I want to say. Every storm in life that you face may not be from the enemy of our soul, but he will try to use it against you. I promise you. It may not be from him, but he will try to use it to drown out your faith. And so Jesus uses that unique word and he rebukes the wind and the waves and simply says, quiet, be still. And if we would remember what N.T. Wright said, the idea that the sea and everything in it is the seedbed of evil, it's where the demonic comes from, it's where that mystery and the depths and the unknown, and the confusion, and the chaos, and the catastrophe, all of that comes up out of the depths. Well, Jesus uses this spiritual command, and he commands the winds and the waves to cease. What's also fascinating is Jesus doesn't conjure up some phrase. Jesus also doesn't say, Heavenly Father, do this. Jesus himself has the authority to stand in that boat and he has the authority to rebuke the wind and the waves and to command that it would be still. The reason why it says wind and waves is because I've been out on the water enough to know that just because the wind isn't blowing doesn't mean that the waves are calm. Jesus commands both. He commands the wind and the waves to be quiet and to be still. And the term that he uses is a rebuke to a demonic force. Now the response of the disciples is stunning to me, but the more I looked at it and prayed over it, it actually makes sense. It says that they were so afraid, they went and they woke up. Jesus, Jesus, wake up, don't you care? And Jesus wakes up, and when he does, he rebukes the wind and the waves. And in verse 41, here's the disciples' response. It says, they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, in the original language, the fear they had when they went to Jesus to wake him up is categorically less than the terrified reality they have after they see him rebuke the wind and the waves. They're actually more terrified now than they were before. Who is this dude? Now, why are they so terrified? It's pretty simple. You see, in the ancient world, by reading the Newer Testament, we know because the Newer Testament writers utilize the Psalms all the time that the Psalms were the books of the Bible that the ancients were reading during the time of Jesus. The Psalms are quoted in the Newer Testament more frequently than any other book from the Older Testament. And if anyone was a sea person, they would have known Psalm 107, verses 23 through 32. I want you to read this silently to yourself as I read it out loud. Psalm 107, 23 to 32. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord and his wonders, wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. 
They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Verse 28, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them up out of their distress. He stilled the storm with a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed, and they were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. You see, I believe the reason why the disciples were terrified is that most of them as seaworthy men knew that psalm and they knew whoever had the power to do what Jesus had just done according to Psalm 107 was God. He's God. Whoever can whisper and the wind and the waves obey him, he's God. And there they are in the boat with him and he calms the storm by commanding it to do so. Again, their response isn't, how did he do that? Their response is, who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? When we think about the idea of the storms of life, And I was thinking about this message all week. I began to listen to a worship song. And it was written by Christine DeMarco through Bethel Music, and it's called It Is Well. And one of the main phrases of that song that she wrote is this. The wind, or I'm sorry, the waves and the wind still know his name. I love that. That in the storms of life, we know we can go to Jesus, and it wasn't a one-time thing, but the waves and the wind still know his name. How do we put feet to our faith in the midst of this? What does it look like? Well, I think we need to look at the response of Jesus to his disciples, They asked the question that many of us have asked. Jesus, don't you care? And his response back is this. Why are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? In other words, we could look at it this way. The way your faith comes alive is when you face things that in the natural make you afraid. But because you follow Jesus and because the Holy Spirit now dwells in you, you can face things that in the natural ought to fill you with fear. But because you know him and the Spirit of God is with you, you have a total different response to things than you would have been without him. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? There's another song that speaks to what we're talking about, and I cannot help but to mention it. I want to say to you, I wouldn't sing the song to you because that would be torturous. I'm going to read to you the lyrics, and they're going to become familiar to you. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole. It is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And Lord, haste the day when faith shall be sight, and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. How many of you have ever heard that song before? Here's why I'm quoting it. Because more often than not, and I've experienced this in my own life, Jesus doesn't always calm the storm. He calms us in the midst of it. 
Jesus doesn't always take away the wind and the waves, but the Bible declares from the older to the newer testament that whatever we're going through, Jesus is with us, always. The writer of that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, that I just mentioned was Horatio Spafford. Many of you know the story, some of you don't, I want to give it to you. Horatio Spafford was a hymn writer and a wealthy attorney in Chicago. He first went through a storm with the death of his two-year-old son. And then during the great fire in Chicago in 1871, it ruined him financially because as a successful lawyer, he had invested heavily in real estate and he lost it all. What he had left was hit again through the economic downturn in 1873 and he ended up deciding to take a trip with his family to Europe. At the last minute, those plans changed. He had to deal with a zoning problem after the fire, and so he sent his family ahead, his wife and his four daughters. It wasn't long after that where the ship that they were on collided with another ship at sea and sank, and all four daughters were lost. His wife Anna survived, and he received this now famous telegram just a little bit later. Her telegram simply said, saved but alone. It tells us that soon after, Spavard Trent went to meet with his grieving wife. And when the ship he was on passed over where his daughters had drowned, he wrote the hymn that we just sang or heard about. The reason why I want to stress this is because God doesn't always take away the wind and the waves. But in Jesus, I can promise you that even though the storm rages, there's a way in which God can give us his peace. I've experienced this in my own life. Where when the storm was raging, I could say with all confidence, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. When we talk about faith in the real world, I know this is touching many of us. I know that you've prayed and prayed and asked God to take certain things away. But the Newer Testament is clear. Sometimes God does, sometimes God doesn't. But I can guarantee you this. If you are in the midst of a storm, the enemy of your soul is trying to use this storm to drown your faith in Jesus. I also want to say this. There is nothing wrong with a person in the middle of the storm looking to Jesus saying, are you awake? Do you even care? I've done that several times in my own life. God, do you even care? I've quoted the Psalms of the Older Testament back to God and said, God, it seems like heaven is like brass. But in the end, in God's presence, I've experienced something that's so unique, and that is a peace that passes all understanding. The natural evidence does not add up to the peace that I've experienced in God's presence. I also want to say this, though that as a church, we are going to be beginning these twice a month Sunday night services. The first one will be August the 4th. During that one hour service from 6.30 to 7.30 over at the City Church Chapel, we're gonna be praying for the sick. We're gonna be laying hands on people and praying. We're also gonna be sitting in God's presence because I have found in my own life that in the midst of God's presence, there is a peace that truly passes all understanding. You know, you're in a storm when you say to God, where are you? Do you care? But I think we also need to take to heart the questions Jesus asked his disciples, and they are two of them. These are back to back. Why are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? We're going to conclude this sermon very, very simply. And that is, is that if you are in the midst of a storm, you are in the midst of a storm, 
and you know that you're in one. And from the depths of your heart, you've said to God, where are you? Are you even awake? But you also hear Jesus saying to you, why are you so afraid? Has fear gripped your life? Jesus would say, why are you so afraid? Now's the time to step out in faith. Now's the time to trust him. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to stand in this moment. If you were in a storm, you'd be willing to stand and say, Jesus, I'm going to stand in faith. I'm not going to sit in fear, but I'm going to stand in faith before you. If that is you, I want you to stand right now as a sign of you standing in faith before God. I often say that the rattle of those chairs are really angels' wings. But as you stand into God's presence, this worship song that Stephen and his team will be leading us in, I want to encourage you to take just a moment to close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, open your heart to God and ask God to touch you by his presence. Open up your heart by faith. And if you've been living in fear instead of faith, I want to encourage you in this moment, in the safety of this spiritual place, that you would open your heart to Jesus in this moment.